Hello and welcome back to our online symposium, Creativity from uh, Vienna to the World. And today our focus is um, careers and networks after migration. So again, a warm welcome, whether you're joining us live today or uh, watching on YouTube. Uh, so we're very excited for our lineup today. Uh, which uh, features my co-organizer of the event, Julia Seklener, and also Janice Staggs joining us from the Neue Gallery. So I am delighted to um, introduce uh, the first speaker today, uh, Janice Staggs, and I will go ahead with her bio and then we will get started. Uh, so first up today is Janice Staggs, who is Director of Curatorial, and manager of publications at the Neue Galerie New York, where she has worked for more than 20 years. During her tenure at the museum, she has curated a number of exhibitions, including Wiener Werkstätte Jewelry, Gustav Klimt and Adela Blockbauer, The Woman in Gold, The Expressionist Nude, and Wiener Werkstätte Fashion and Accessories, among many others. She also served as co-curator of Wiener Werkstätte, The Luxury of Beauty from 2017, and Ernst Ludwig Kirchner. She is the author of the Neue Gallery's exhibition catalog on Wiener Werkstätte jewelry. She has also contributed essays to various Neue Gallery catalogs, as well as outside publications on various um, topics. She is a specialist in the decorative arts, and her work focuses on the intersection between the fine and decorative arts with an emphasis on the era of Vienna 1900. Staggs has lectured widely and in 2017, she taught a graduate seminar on Vienna 1900 for the master's program in the history of design and curatorial studies at Parsons, the new school for design in conjunction with the Cooper Hewitt, uh, of the uh, Smithsonian Design Museum. So without further ado, uh, warmest welcome to Janice and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Megan. I really appreciate the lovely introduction. Um, yes, and looking forward to sharing with you all today um, some information about one of my favorite fig figures from Vienna 1900, Friederica Maria Birmonti. So with that, I'll begin. Viennese-born socialite Friederica Maria Bermonti, known to close friends as Fritzi, is renowned as the only person portrayed by both Gustav Klimt and Egon Schiele in full-length portraits. But she was more than just a famous sitter. Born and raised in Austria, she emigrated to the United States in 1936. In New York City, she directed a nonprofit gallery known simply as the Artist Gallery until 1962. The Artist Gallery exhibited the work of both American and European emigre artists. No commission was taken, so artists received full payment for any sales. This unusual arrangement was possible due to the support of financial donors. An illustrious list of sponsors, including Austrian architect and designer Josef Hoffmann, in addition to art critics, curators, and museum directors, added the necessary cachet. The artist exhibited included Joseph Albers, Lionel Feiniger, Adolf Gottlieb, Hans Hoffmann, Louise Nevelson, and Robert Smithson, among many, many others. Despite Bermonti's significant contributions, there has been little critical study of her time in the United States. Art historian Alessandro Comini was one of the first to interview Fritzi and to document important aspects of her life story, especially her years in Vienna. More recently, Margaret Greiner published an impressive historical fictionalized account of her life. My presentation today will both provide an overview of the history of the artist gallery and attempt to shed light on Fritzi's instrumental role in the gallery's success. Friederica Maria Beer was born in Vienna in January 1891. Her father was Emil Beer and her mother, Isabella, owned and operated the Kaiser Bar and the Gelbersaal popular restaurant and nightclub frequented by people from the art and theater circles. It was located on the Krugerstrasse in Vienna's first district where dancing and jazz were common entertainments. The Beer family also owned a restaurant in Baden. 
And through the time spent in Baden, Fritzi came to know Hans Böhler, son of a wealthy industrialist. Fritzi and Hans would become lifelong friends and collaborators. Hans Böhler was born in September 1884 in Vienna. His father Otto was the magnate of the Böhler family's iron and steelworks company. The Bullers were passionate about art and especially music and had the means to lend their support to admired musicians and to assemble a prominent art collection. Hans enjoyed a privileged upbringing and was not involved with the family business. Instead, he enrolled at Vienna's Academy of Fine Arts in 1902 at age 18, but left after only a few days for Jaska's private school of painting. But he didn't remain there for long either. He was largely self-taught, and according to Fritzi, part of why he quit formal training is because he could afford to hire his own models. Childhood friends, Fritzi and Hans, became romantically involved around 1907, even though he was seven years her senior. It was through Hans that Fritzi developed an interest in art, and he introduced her to the artistic elite in Vienna. She told one interviewer that when she was 18, she and Hans began to go to museums. And from that point on, her love for art never left her. In 1908, when she was 17, Hans painted a nude portrait of her, which was included in the Kunstschau Wien under the title Damenbildnis. Undoubtedly, the couple went to the exhibition, which had been organized by the so-called Klimtgruppe, band of artists who left the Vienna Secession in 1905. Hoffman had designed the exhibition complex and nearly 200 artists participated in the multidisciplinary presentation, which included a wide range of fine decorative and graphic arts. It was the social event of the season. Neither Fritzi nor Hans's parents approved of the burgeoning romance between the young couple. In addition, Hans had declared his intention to never marry, thus there seemed little prospect of an upstanding outcome to the relationship. Fritzi was sent to Brussels, where she learned French, and to London to finish her schooling. At his father's behest, Hans made a lengthy trip to the Orient in 1910 and 1911. He visited Japan, China, Korea, Shanghai, and India via the Trans-Siberian Railway. Hans's father wanted him to oversee the family business interest in the Far East, and the journey also gave Hans new creative inspirations for his outwork. After returning to Vienna, Hans designed seven postcards for the Wiener Werkstätte in 1912, based upon figurative sketches that he made during his travels, such as the one reproduced in Deutsche Kunst und Dekoration that I'm showing on the left. Despite the separation of distance and time, the bond between Fritzi and Hans remained strong. In 1912, she triumphantly wrote to him when she turned 21 and was no longer under parental control, proclaiming, now I am free. Hans returned to Vienna and the pair reunited. In 1913 and 14, Hans, accompanied by his brother Richard and Fritzi, made an extended journey to South America and the West Indies. But with the death of his father in 1914, Hans came into his inheritance, and this enabled him to focus solely on his art and to make adjustments to his lifestyle. That same year, he moved into a new studio designed by Josef Hoffmann on the Linke Wienseil near the Vienna Secession. Hans Böhler also had Hoffmann set up an apartment for Fritzi nearby in Vienna's 6th district. Here she lived surrounded by Wiener Werkstätte objects as well as artwork from Hans's own collection. Even though the couple was unwed, Hans provided some financial support, enabling Fritzi to enjoy a luxurious standard of living. In a conversation with Comini, Fritzi described herself as a walking advertisement for the Wiener Werkstätte and said that she dressed exclusively in their clothing at this time. Fritzi also bragged that her apartment was completely furnished by the Wiener Werkstätte, and her boast is visibly borne out by photos such as the ones I'm showing here. It was during this period that Fritzi was painted by Gustav Klimt and Egon Schiele. In both, she sumptuously attired in Wiener Werkstätte clothing. She could afford the Schiele portrait because it was only, I say, 600 crowns, but Hans generously gifted her the much more expensive picture by Klimt, which cost 20,000 crowns. At the time that these pictures were painted, she lived the life of a carefree socialite, devoting herself to leisure activities. When Comini quizzed her many years later about what she did during that period, Fritzi's reply was, nothing, just living, going to the theater, 
to art exhibitions, to the opera. The same year as her Klimt portrait was completed, Frincy spent her summer holiday on the Atresse. Klimt was on vacation there at the same time. A few photos survive confirming that they socialized together, such as the two I'm illustrating, and they suggest that a friendship must have sprung up between Klimt and his young precocious sitter. After Klimt's death in February 1918, Fritzi worked for a time at Gustav Nebehe's gallery until 1920. Nebehe had been Klimt's dealer and his friend, and Fritzi said she was responsible for organizing and stamping the drawings from Klimt's estate. Later in life, she admitted she wasn't particularly good at this job, as she sometimes applied the stamps haphazardly. And in the sketches on the right, were, which are actually for her portrait, the stamp is actually upside down. Although the romance between Fritzi and Hans only lasted until 1917, they remained close lifelong friends, even as they took up relationships with others. In March 1927, Fritzi and Italian sea captain Emanuele Monte married in Vienna. Fritzi changed her last name to Biermonti. After selling the art and furnishings from her Vienna apartment, she moved with her husband to Capri, where they ran a restaurant called the Kater Hidigaigai. The Kater Hidigaigai was popular with German and other European tourists who enjoyed the mild climate of the region. Hans visited Bermonti in the winter of 1927 with his girlfriend Elsa Hulik, and in 1930 he returned to Capri. Fritzi herself remained there for four years, returning to Vienna around 1932 after her marriage ended. And in late 1932, Fritzi and Hans were both back in Vienna and hanging out at the Kaiser Bar when an American tourist named Hugh Stix wandered in and ordered a Clover Club cocktail. It was unfamiliar to the bar staff, but fortunately, Hans knew the recipe. It's comprised of gin, lemon juice, raspberry syrup, and an egg white. Hans and Fritzi struck up a conversation with Styx. Styx had been born in New York in 1907 and expressed a love for art from as far back as he could remember. Growing up, he knew various artists, and both his brother and sister had studied at the Art Students League in New York. After graduating from Harvard in 1932, he undertook postgraduate studies at New York University, the Fogg Museum, and at Harvard. And although he considered pursuing museum work or some other profession connected with art, instead he opted for a career as an executive as a, at a wholesale grocery firm where his father was chairman of the board. Probably for financial reasons, I would guess. Nonetheless, Sticks retained, as he put it, a terrific urge to do something in the field of fine arts. From his estimation, opening a contemporary art gallery would offer him more freedom. So he went to Europe to see art firsthand, and this led to that faithful meeting, fateful meeting at the Kaiser Bar. While in Vienna, Styx visited Hans Brüller's studio, and at some point after returning to New York, Styx decided to open the artist gallery, and he invited Fritzi to be a director she agreed. In the summer of 1936, Styx assembled a board of directors and had the legal paperwork prepared. One of Styx's fellow classmates from Harvard, Thaddeus Clapp, was hired as co-director. Clapp brought an academic background to the position. A graduate of Williams College in 1930, he had also done advanced studies at the University of Chicago and at the Fogg Art Museum at Harvard. Clapp drafted the initial program for the artist gallery, which was published as a small brochure. The program opens by attesting that, and I quote, the founders of the art gallery feel that due to unavoidable factors in our modern civilization, many younger men who are potentially great artists and many older men who have arrived artistically are unable to bring their works before the art loving public. The art gallery aimed to solve this problem by making art more broadly accessible. Now, Fritzi might not have had the academic training of Clapp or of Styx, but she had connections with prominent European artists. Furthermore, she had a cultivated and sophisticated taste in the arts based on her time in Vienna and in the companionship of Hans Bohler and that circle of artists. Clapp left the artist gallery in 1937 and Fritzi took over as sole director until its closure in 1962. Her easy life of leisure was now over. For the next 25 odd years, she played an influential role in shaping the American art scene. 
Fritzi, along with Styx, helped promote many artists, some of whom went on to have truly illustrious careers, including Adolf Gottlieb, Hans Hoffmann, Ad Reinhardt, and Robert Smithen, as I mentioned in the introduction, among many others. And it's worth noting that the artist gallery shows were juried. Both Fritzi and Styx were responsible for reviewing artwork, and they had to agree that an artist warranted an exhibition. This insistence on quality and merit led to museum shows and acquisitions of work by the artists represented by the gallery. And here I'm showing Fritzi's business card, signature, and a postcard from the artist gallery to demonstrate she was inconsistent with the spelling of her name. Sometimes she retained the hyphen and her married name, and other times she did not. Also, she changed the spelling of her first name after coming to the United States, shifting from Friederica to Federica, which she viewed as more American. And as you can imagine, all of this variations in her name spelling um, make research challenging to some degree. The artist gallery officially opened during the depression in Greenwich Village at 33 West 8th Street. The first season ran from October to May of 1937. Over the years of its existence, the gallery occupied five different locations. It remained in the village through the early 1940s and moved to Midtown after the war. Its last location was on Lexington Avenue between 64th and 65th Street. The inaugural show was a solo exhibition for Hans Buller. Like Fritzi, Hans came to the US in 1936. He was around 52 years old at that time. And as a new immigrant to New York City, he put the artist gallery criteria of being an older artist who had had a hard time bringing his work to the public. In fact, he was completely unknown to an American audience. The show opened October 4th and it ran through November 7th. Styx humorously recalled that even though 500 people were invited to the opening, only one person came and it was actually an artist looking for gallery representation. But clearly things quickly turned around and so much so that the exhibition was extended by one week due to popular demand. Hoffman wrote the text for the brochure predicting, quote, I believe that the paintings of Hans Buller will find their rightful place in America as the American art public has the fresh and vital sensibility necessary to grasp things new and great. The exhibition included 16 oil paintings completed between 1927 and 1936, as well as drawings. Three oil paintings and several drawings sold. The show then traveled to the Germanic Museum, later the Bush Reisinger, at Harvard. Nine exhibitions were organized during the first year that the Artist Gallery was in operation, including the first solo show for Ben Zion, an artist from the Ukraine who had settled in New York. Another emigre artist featured in the first year was the so-called Baron of Greenwich Village, Dehersh Margulies, who was born in Romania. Parisian-born artist Gaston Lechamp was also honored with a solo show, as was Hans Hoffmann of Berlin. As per the artist gallery records, these exhibitions were seen by 10,000 people. In general, no special shows were organized during the summer months, but during the season, the gallery maintained long hours from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., and it was also open on the weekends. Various artists from the Vienna Circle of Fritzi and Hans were also featured at the artist gallery over the years, especially in the beginning, including Albert Paris Gutterslow and Max Oppenheimer, nicknamed Mop. Work by Gutterslow was shown in November 1938 alongside art by Laura Steig. Gutterslow's work was also featured in subsequent shows, including a group, group exhibition held in October 1940 and a solo show in November 1956, and you see a flyer for that on the right. Mop's work was exhibited beginning with the Christmas exhibition of 1936. New York Times critic Howard DeVry, admiring Mop's portraits of musicians, described them as done with humor and sympathetic insight. And one painting by Mop was also included in a group show held in June of 1941. But Mop complained his picture wasn't hung to the best advantage and even claimed that the staff at the artist gallery were deliberately trying to harm him as an artist. This accusation was particularly offensive because the artist gallery had helped facilitate Mop's entry to the US during the war, and the artist gallery responded by sending a letter in mid June of 1941 where they severed ties with him, explaining that the work at the artist gallery, and this is a quote, is based on mutual goodwill and cooperation. Any demonstration of ill will and superiority above other artists 
is damaging to the whole atmosphere and has to be avoided, end quote. But the issue must have been subsequently smoothed over as Mop's work was later included in two group shows held in 1947. Emily Janauer, writing for the New York World Telegram, highlighted one of Mop's drawings as one of the most engaging pieces in the show. Another recent European emigre artist featured with the solo show at the Artist Gallery during its initial years of operation was Bauhaus artist and teacher, Josef Albers. It was mounted simultaneously with a major exhibition on the Bauhaus held at MoMA, which also featured his work. The artist gallery presentation was actually the first solo show for Albers in the United States. And the presentation included 20 recent oil paintings done in an abstract geometric style. One was lent by the Societe Anonyme and it's now in the collection of the Yale University Art Gallery and pictured here on the right. One review of the exhibition endorsed Albers's paintings, noting that they offer decided evidence of taste in color and arrangement and praise them as belonging distinctly in the field of design. But it wasn't just European artists who were caught up in the chaos as the Nazis rose to power. Some American expats also recognized the danger they represented and wanted to return to the US. An intriguing example is found in the couple of William H. Johnson and Holtsche Kraka. In this instance, it appears that the show came about due to Johnson writing a letter to the artist gallery in January, 1938, explaining that although he was American, he had cre created all of his work up to this point in Europe, suggesting that the artist gallery at that time had a reputation of favoring European artists. The following February, the artist gallery held a show for Johnson and his Danish wife, Holtsche Kraka. Johnson was an African-American artist born in Florence, South Carolina. He had moved to New York where he studied at the National Academy of Design. One of his teachers, Charles Webster Hawthorne, financed a study trip abroad, believing that Johnson would face less discrimination in Europe than in the United States. In 1928, while well, in the south of France, Johnson met Kraka and they married in 1930, later settling in Denmark. Johnson's work from this time shows the strong influence of the German Expressionists, as seen in the woodcut portrait of his wife on the left. As a side note, German artist Christoph Wohl was his brother-in-law, as Wohl was married to Holtz's sister Erna. At the artist gallery, Johnson exhibited watercolors and colored woodcuts from his travels in Africa and Europe. Kraka's ceramics were also included in the artist gallery presentation. They were described by Howard DeVry, writing for the New York Times, as done with a, quote, striking sense of pattern. A reporter for the Art News praised them as rough in surface and simple as to shapes, Glazes are subdued in tone, and these pieces recommend themselves for the sturdy quality of their designs. Tapestries by Kraka were also on view, most notably a handwoven copy of the Baldeschroy Church tapestry made in Norway in 1180. It took Kraka three years to make hers, and she used only natural dyes in an effort to be faithful to the original. Unfortunately, the johnson Crocker joint show was not a financial success. Only one work was sold, a watercolor by Johnson, for $75. Nonetheless, the artist gallery tried to help him get established in the United States, but the couple faced various challenges in the ensuing years, including a studio fire and illnesses. Crocker died of cancer in 1944, and Johnson never recovered from the loss. He spent the remainder of his life in various mental institutions and died in 1970. But today he is admired as one of the most important African-American artists of the early 20th century. And I extend my deepest gratitude to Stephen Malta for sharing information um, and photos with me on Johnson and Kraka. The ambitious exhibition program of the Artist Gallery was possible because Styx had gained the endorsement of prominent individuals from the art world. The founding list of sponsors is comprised of an illustrious group of figures, including Chair Abbott, founding associate director of MoMA, Austrian architect and designer, as well as co-founder of the Vienna Secession and the Wiener Werkstätte, Josef Hoffmann, Fisk Campbell, who established the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University, and later director of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, Charles Kuhn, director of the Bush Reisinger Museum, Walter Pock, who helped organize the Armory Show, Paul Sachs, Associate Director of the Fogg Museum and developer of one of the earliest museum study programs in the United States, 
and James Johnson Sweeney, who was a curator at MoMA and later director at the Guggenheim. And that's just to cite a few of the sponsors um, of the gallery. A much larger pool of people contributed financially to the artist gallery over the years, enabling Sticks to run it as a nonprofit organization. Reviewing the artist gallery's financial records, it's clear that various Sticks members were major financial supporters. Other donors include Harry Abrams, Joseph Hirschhorn, Eli Jacques Kahn, the Samuel Kress Foundation, Samuel Kuhn, members of the Lehman, Rockefeller, Rothschild, and Warburg families, and Paul Sachs, among many, many other dedicated contributors. Nonetheless, funding remained a challenge throughout the gallery's existence. Various events were held, including dinner parties and raffles to try to raise much needed monies. And I'm showing here three advertisements for such events. The postcard at the left is for a raffle held in tandem with a cocktail reception from 1939, where J.B. Neumann appeared as a special guest. Styx's second wife, Marguerite, organized festive dinner parties with the Parisian flair on a few occasions to both instill goodwill with the community and also to help refill the artist gallery's coffers. In its first four years of operation, the artist gallery exhibited work by more than 60 artists and held 35 one-man shows with an attendance at over 40,000. In June, 1940, the gallery moved to West 13th Street. And as per an article in the New York Times, the new location was larger and would allow for having one-man shows in one section and group shows in another. Greek-American artist uh, Aristodemos Caldas had a solo show at the 13th Street location in November and December of 1941. It included the painting shown at right entitled Absorbing Art. Birmonti recalled that Caldas painted it after seeing Edmund, who worked as a porter for the artist gallery, become so transfixed by the art on display that he stopped his work and sat down to admire it. Albert Barnes snapped up the painting for his collection where it remains today. The artist gallery temporarily closed during the war, but Styx kept busy, and beginning in 1942, he hosted a weekly radio program on WNYC called Art in New York. He interviewed artists, art critics, and gallery and museum directors with the aim of helping the public to become more comfortable with modern art. After the war, the artist gallery reopened in Midtown, and here its ambitions were renewed. They spent the 1946 season on 55th Street, and in May of 1947, they moved to East 57th Street. Work by the Austrian emigre Liza Salzer was featured at the new prestigious 57th Street location. Born in 1906 to a well-to-do family and the only child, Salzer's parents encouraged her interest in art. After completing her studies at the Academy in 1929, she set up a studio in Vienna and spent the summers with the artist colony in Zinkenbach. Salzer fled Austria in 1939 due to the rise of the Nazis, and tragically, both of her parents were killed in the Holocaust. Salzer settled in New York and lived off the income from painting portraits of children and landscape scenes of Central Park, such as the one I'm showing on the left. A visit to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1945 led Salzer to explore a new direction. Intrigued by 16th century Limoges enamel, she began experimenting to determine how they were made. And eventually she mastered the technique. It was her painted enamel work that was featured in a solo show at the Artist Gallery in 1948. Shortly thereafter, Saltzer and her husband moved to Seattle in 1950, where she remained and worked until her death at age 99 in 2005. In June 1949, the Artist Gallery lost its lease on 57th Street, but afterwards they found a new home on Lexington Avenue between 64th and 65th, where they remained until the gallery closed. The Artist Gallery celebrated its 15th anniversary with a show called 15 Years in Review, held at the Washington Square Inn on University Place. It included the work of nearly 100 artists. The accompanying brochure bragged that the Artist Gallery had exhibited the work of 350 artists in 195 shows organized since opening in 1936. And work by the artists that they had exhibited now graced the collections of numerous museums, including the Art Institute of Chicago, the Barnes Foundation, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Modern Art, and the Whitney, among others. And this boast was accurate. 
For the gallery's 20th anniversary in 1956, they mounted an exhibition called Reunion on Lexington Avenue with 41 works lent exclusively by museums from across the United States. African-American artist Selma Burke was also honored with a solo show after the war. Her sculptures had been exhibited at previous artist gallery presentations, including a group show held in May 1939 and in one from 1950, and I'm showing the postcard announcement on the left. Burke was one of 10 children born to a Methodist minister in North Carolina. Her interest in art was not discouraged exactly, but she was urged to pursue a more practical profession. Burke studied nursing, but after moving to New York City, she got involved with the Harlem Renaissance Movement and began her formal art training. In the 1930s, she continued her studies in Europe, first with Michael Pavolny at the Kunstgewerbeschule and later in Paris with Aristide Maillot and Henri Matisse. But concerned by the rise of the Nazis, she returned to the United States. Bowler and Burke became involved around 1937, and he painted a double portrait of Fritzi and Selma in 1938. Fritzi casually rests her arm and hand on Selma's shoulder, suggesting a shared camaraderie and an intimacy between them. In 1952, Burke was honored with a solo show at the Artist Gallery, which included 17 figurative sculptures of both carved stone and wood. Some were lent from private collections, but others were available for purchase. And the two photographs on the left and center are installation views from that show. Burke enjoyed a long career and also helped others to gain an art education. She died in August 1994 at age 94 due to complications from cancer. Now, one of the most renowned exhibitions in the artist gallery's history was a special show held in 1955 called Seeing Art Through the Eye Graphic Gala. The exhibition was comprised of black and white drawings on eight and a half by 11 inch paper submitted by just over 200 artists, including Albert Gottlieb, Hoffman, Milton Avery, William de Kooning, Richard Diepenkorn, Lionel Feiniger, Hutter Slow, Franz Klein, Nevelson, Ad Reinhardt, and so many others. All were donated by artists that had either been represented by the gallery or who supported its mission. And all works were shown anonymously and signed on the reverse only. The list of illustrious names is a testament to what the artist gallery meant to both American and European artists. The theme was man and woman and each was priced at $25 regardless of the artist who made it. The show was a resounding success and I'm sure there was something fun about going through and trying to figure out which artists had made which drawing. Um, on the opening day, 75 works sold, and by the end of that first week, only one third remained. Now, the Artist Gallery had held a similar show in October of 38. The aim had been to counter bias toward well-known artists and to instead encourage visitors to judge based upon artistic merit rather than falling prey to what they called the name game. Hans Bowler's work was exhibited at the Artist Gallery on numerous occasions over the years, and it was featured in a 1960 retrospective celebrating the Artist Gallery's 25th anniversary. 28 paintings were included, ranging in date from 1913 to 1959, in addition to a handful of drawings and watercolors. At this juncture, Bowler was 75 years old. He had returned to Vienna, but as an expression of gratitude for everything that Styx had done for him, he donated a major painting called Jack's Bar in Harlem, shown on the right, to the Belvedere Museum in 1961. Tragically, that same year, Hans Bowler died in September of 61 in Vienna as the result of complications following a hip fracture. He was 77 years old at the time. Fritzi was named executor of his estate, and she returned to Vienna to settle his affairs. The artist gallery itself also came full circle. One of the last shows was dedicated to drawings by Hans Buller and the artist gallery officially closed October 1st, 1962. Stix explained that it seemed the right time to shutter the doors. By the early 1960s, New York City was home to a thriving network of galleries with more than 200 places where an artist could exhibit. So there was less need to provide a venue for emerging or overlooked talent. This confirms that the artist gallery had succeeded in generating interest in a wider public in the appreciation and purchase of modern art as per their own goal expressed in the founding program. 
In conclusion, with this presentation, I've tried to shed light on the activities of the Artist Gallery and also to demonstrate Fritzi's critical role as its director. Her impact on the modern American art scene was considerable and remains largely overlooked. After Bullard's death, she seemed to consider her own legacy. In 1964, she donated the Wiener Werkstatt dress worn in her Klimt portrait to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She also lent her Klimt and Schiele portraits to various exhibitions, most prominently to the groundbreaking 1965 show Gustav Klimt and Egon Schiele held at the Guggenheim Museum. But more important than these tangible donations and loans was the positive impact that she had had on so many people through her pivotal role at the Artist Gallery. She worked tirelessly on behalf of artists and established friendships with many of them. For example, in December 1947, painter John Griot wrote to her in gratitude, saying, it is quite enlightening to know that there are persons that are interested in what one is trying to express. Fritzi herself in a 1967 interview confided that her love of art began when she was about 18 and that it had never left her. She added, I quote, I think my last thought will be art. In one of the artist gallery brochures, Stixie offered, sorry, Stix proffered a note of appreciation to all who had helped the gallery succeed. And he singled out Fritzi by acknowledging that her quote, sensitivity, understanding and devotion has had so much to do with its success. Indeed, the artist gallery could not have wished for a more dedicated, an enthusiastic champion. And I'll just end by saying thank you all for listening. And I really just want to also extend my appreciation and congratulations to Megan and Yulia for this very important and wonderful symposium. And thank you for inviting me to participate. Janice, thank you so much for this so fresh, um, amazing research. Absolutely fascinating. And I know that I um, certainly have questions along with the mm -hmm. audience. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce now uh, the co-organizer of this symposium and broader uh, project, <clears throat> who is of course the um, incomparable Yulia Seklina. So Yulia Seklina is research fellow in art history at Masaryk University in Brno in the Czech Republic. She specializes in modern art in Central Europe with a particular interest in cultural production in and about peripheries, as well as questions of gender and minority representation. Her current research <clears throat> is focused on modernism beyond the metropolis in interwar Austria, Czechoslovakia and Hungary, and is part of the collaborative project Continuity and Rupture Art and Architecture in Central Europe, 1918 to 1939, which is funded by the European Research Council. Her most recent publications include contributions to periodization in the art historiographies of Central and Eastern Europe, as well as a book, Erasures and Eradications in Modern Viennese Art, Architecture and Design from Rutledge 2022, as well as the um, journals Austrian Studies, and the Austrian History Yearbook. Warmest welcome to Julia, thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Megan. And it will be a very hard act to follow um, <laughs> the great presentation from before, but I'll do my best. Um, and we'll focus on uh, one single artist uh, for this talk. Liesel Weil, Previously illustrator for Die Bühne, Vienna, now reliably in New York. With this short announcement, the Brussels-based emigre magazine, The Nubian Echo, introduces the Viennese migrant Liesel Weil in its 1940 column, Who is Where?, which aimed to reconnect friends and families torn apart by war and persecution. We do not know who searched for, for Weil, nor if they ever found her. Instead of a reunion, the entry represents a rupture. It is the time when Weil, a 30-year-old cosmopolite and successful cartoonist for various newspapers and magazines, effectively disappeared from the Austrian press. Letters indicate that her journey after forced emigration in 1938 first took her to Holland. A letter by Weil from September 1938 locates her in Rotterdam, waiting for her visa to the United States. 
Significantly, the letter was more than an ordinary inquiry. It belongs to a series of so-called freak letters collected by American diplomat Leland Burnett Morris, who would save mail by visa applicants that were specially presented to gain attention in an overflowing system. In Weil's case, the letter not only caught Morris's attention, but also shows her line of work at a moment in time when emigration forced her to recalibrate her career. The letter is decorated with a naive self-portrait caricature at the center, waiting in an office. An accompanying text in German reads, I sit very sadly in Amsterdam, since I was told at the consulate in Rotterdam that my papers have not yet arrived. The sketch is drawn quickly across the formal inquiry, adding a humorous note to a desperate situation. Morris noted that he found the drawing quite amusing, while historian Melissa Jane Taylor has suggested that the letter appears to have been written by a child, although none of the writers gave their age. Even though both of these descriptions are not quite correct, in that the cartoon was to emphasize the author's precarious situation until receipt of a visa, and that it was produced by a woman rather than a child, they nonetheless encapsulate the two significant aspects of Weil's work. Humorous popular cartooning, one of Weil's main lines of work until 1938, and educational entertainment for children, in which she began to specialize in the years following her arrival to the United States in 1939. Taking this as a point of departure, my paper today introduces the different aspects of Weil's career on both sides of the Atlantic, and shows how her multivalent practice in Vienna set her up for a career in the United States after immigration. In many, way, in many ways, Weil's continuous work in what we might call niche professions epitomizes the reasons why her work has been underrepresented for so long, even though it is slowly being incorporated into histories of graphic design and children's literature by scholars such as Kirsten Crick Eigner and Christian Marischka, um, who I'm very happy to have here in the audience today. Most recently, Weil's work has been included in the Better Half exhibition and catalog at Vienna's Jewish Museum, for example, um, but she has also been included in anthologies of children's literature in emigration. So in this sense, we continue um, with this talk, um, the theme of our lecture series with a focus on child-related creativity. However, in, in Weil's case, uh, this focuses more on popular entertainment education. Indeed, we may even argue that the different lines of work that Weil followed throughout her career, cartooning for popular illustrated magazines and children's books, illustrations and writing, as well as more experimental pro projects such as live dancing and drawing on stage, all represented marginalized practices which have led to Weil's erasure from history. Yet her activities represent an extraordinarily prolific case which is exemplary, exemplary for several other female Viennese emigres. The painter Bettina Bauer Ehrlich, for example, who was uh, of Weil's generation and emigrated to the United Kingdom, also became a successful writer and author of children's books, even though her primary focus in Vienna was on painting. Taking this into account, my focus on Weil today is a case study, which it tends to position children's entertainment as an important second career for Viennese emigre women more broadly. I should add that Weil, like Bauer, as well as their friend Lisa Salzer, who we've already met, met today, um, also represent a younger generation of artists than those who have stood in focus in this event series so far. Born in the first decade of the 20th century, they had little experience of the Habsburg monarchy and only finished their education and training in the late 1920s. Their careers in Austria, in interwar Austria, were thus relatively short and often ended in emigration at quite an early, at quite a young age. And Weil's example is a point in case here. She was born in Vienna in 1910 under the name of uh, Ilse Elisabeth Weiss and took on the name Weil with her adoption by the businessman Isidor Weil, who married her mother in 1923. From the age of nine, she attended Franz Tischek's youth art classes at the Kunstgewerbeschule, where she continued to study from 1926 to 1930. In addition to her artistic education, music, and she attended ballet classes by the famous Viennese expressionist dancer Grete Wiesenthal um, as a girl and as a teenager, 
and also took part in pageants and other public performances. Weil's comprehensive schooling in performance, art and design set her at the midst of central cultural institutions of interwar Vienna and shows the different options open to young women of her generation who sought to pursue creative professions. Embracing both a rising fashion of Alpine culture in Austria as well as a cosmopolitan lifestyle, with Paris becoming a frequently cited reference, Weil's career at the time was in many ways typical for that of a young Austrian artist in the First Republic who played with the different registers of modernity and tradition in their multivalent creative work. In the mid-1930s, Weil worked as a stage decorator, including productions in Vienna's Josefstädter Theater. More importantly, however, was her career as a newspaper illustrator and cartoonist, which she already began as a teenager, telling, uh, selling her first drawing at the very young age of 14. Over the course of the 1930s, she contributed to a range of uh, Viennese magazines and newspapers, including Die Stunde, Das Interessante Blatt, and Götz von Berlichingen. The most important publication for her career was no doubt the illustrated magazine Die Bühne, for which she regularly produced cartoons and illustrations that provided humorous commentary on Viennese middle class life and the roles of modern women especially. The artist also positioned herself within this context and events such as study trips became illustrated travel reports for the Bühne's readers. A 1930 sojourn in Paris, for example, was serialized under the heading Liesel Weil's Picture Broadsheet of Paris or uh, Bilderbogen von Liesel Weil. Uh, in it, Weil shows a series of cartoons under a joint heading, such as uh, in the case here, Autumn Hunt in November 1930, in which women chase for the perfect figure, for love, for money, but also bed bugs in a rundown little Paris apartment. She also illustrated contributions to the Bühne by writers such as Claire Goll, including Modern Martyrs, which satirizes the beauty dictate and its often painful procedures for women, uh, for the woman who wants to be fashionable as well as modern. Although ostensibly positioned as light entertainment, Weil's cartoons and illustrations demonstrate acute observational skills and a shorthand style, which could transmit these impressions with economizing expression to readers. While she was not the only young woman to produce cartoon drawings for illustrated magazines at the time, um, others including Ernie Kniepet and Paula Keller, for example, uh, Weil's renderings of the lives of women are nonetheless extraordinary in their wide range and humorous yet insightful expression. A particularly notable summary of Weil's repertoire of modern women is the ABC of Women, published in the Bühne in 1933. Each letter of the alphabet is represented by a different type of modern femininity, starting with Anna, the chef, and ending with the milkmaid, Zenzi. In between, there are showgirls, Dolly and Doddy, uh, Kunstgewerblerinnen, Etta and Feller, a sportswoman, Inge, the divorcee, Tilde, and the chemistry student, Vera. In including Czech and Hungarian names, as well as women from different social classes, Weil's alphabet shows a plethora of different characters that she would, indeed, even though most of her characters are quite clearly at home in Vienna, such as Mitzel, the famous uh, Viennese sweet girl, others such as Tensi are decidedly rural characters. The inclusion of these countryside figures discloses Weil's mobility, which not only took place between Vienna and Paris, but also included locations in rural Austria. They particularly appear during the summer holidays in the summer frische months in the Salzkammergut Lake district, where she became a member of the Zinkenbach uh, painters colony on Lake Wolfgang. In relation to the colony, the broader circumstances of Weil's work also resurfaced and highlight several personal connections that started in this environment and would become important connections, not only in Austria, but also in the United States after immigration. The most significant contact in this regard is another Liesel, Liesel Salzer again, um, with whom uh, Weil collaborated closely in the 1930s. Um, they exhibited together at several occasions um, and um, striked up a friendship that would last for the rest of their lives. Salzer's memoirs of the summers in the Salzgammer 
in the Salzkammergut, Picture Summers at Lake Wolfgang as a dynamic and experimental artistic environment in which young female artists could engage with, with writers. Uh, Hilde Spiel, um, the writer, for example, also plays an important role. Um, composers and other artists of different ages and political convictions as well, um, often leading to new projects and collaborations. In Weil's case, this included cover designs for the music sheets um, I'm, I'm naming here the popular operetta, The White Horse Inn, but I couldn't find the cover, so I'm showing you a different, quite uh, rural-themed one. Um, while the close-by Salzburg Festival, of course, also became a frequently occurring point of interest. While illustrations for the Bühne on the occasion of the Salzburg Festival are a striking mixture of naive forms and simple lines, paired with a sense of light-hearted humor. They include interview with a dirndl dress, for example, in which a dirndl, the traditional uh, folk dress, in a Salzburg shop muses about its importance in modern fashion. Playing farmer's wife and farmer is le plus chic at the moment, I mean up to date. Telling readers about potential French and Japanese customers, the dress wishes to be bought by an English woman. While it is born in Salzburg, it feels at home in the world. In an extended sense, this strong local Austrian flavor paired with the cosmopolitan lifestyle is what defines Weil's work throughout the 1930s, most visible in her cartoons, but also in other illustration projects. In other words, a passion for music and humorous drawing, playing with elements of Austrian folk culture while deeply embedded in the life of a modern socialite, um, all manifested Weil's presence in the interwar press as one of Austria's first female cartoonists. With the annexation of Austria to the Third Reich in March 1938, however, Weil's uh, unusual career came to a quick end. Together with her sister and her nephew, she was forced to emigrate, waiting in Holland to receive a visa for the United States. This forced emigration marks not only a personal rupture in her biography. Her pre-war work has almost wholly been forgotten, even though her many cartoons and illustrations offer refreshing insights into the ways a young female artist perceived life in Viennese society between the wars. In this regard, Weil's drawings might be compared to the Glesheimer Cent, both the cartoons of Erika Giovanna Klein, which she um, finished, which she drew in Salzburg, who was also a student of Tzizek. However, while Klein's cartoons were in the form of private letters to friends, Weils were printed regularly in the press, thus representing an intrinsic part of popular Viennese culture. The playful approach she took in these illustrations, always pairing an acute sense of observation with joyful imagery, would remain a significant aspect of her work as in or in her second career in the United States. Arriving in New York in 1939, Weil initially worked as a decorator for shop windows for Lanz, a popular Salzburg-based or originally um, Salzburg-based business, uh, specializing in fashion inspired by traditional Austrian costumes, which had recently opened branches in Los Angeles and New York. At this time, Weil also married Julius Marx and became an American citizen. Like many artist migrants who had built careers before in Europe, Weil's professional life suffered from her forced move into exile and her profession as a cartoonist with intimate knowledge of her immediate Austrian environment also had to be recalibrated to her new life in the United States. In Weil's case, this meant a reorientation towards new audiences whom she, to whom she could transmit her interest in music and drawing, as well as her knowledge of life elsewhere. And that, that audience was children. In 1946, Weil illustrated her first children's book, Doll's House, written by Marian Moss, followed by Jakob Letel's The Truth from 1946, which Weil both wrote and illustrated. Over the course of the next decades, children's books became the artist's main line of work, building on her interest in music and different cultures as recurring themes. One of her most popular books was a biography of the Austrian composer Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, Wolfgang the, Fer Wolfgang, the first six years in the life of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart um, from 1991. I might have to check if I got my date right here. Um, but musical topics also occurred in other examples. Weil wrote and published a picture book of the Czech composer Betsy Smetana's opera, The Bartered Bride, as well as of uh, Rossini's The Magic Toy Shop, 
the latter in collaboration uh, with the Lincoln Center. In all these projects, Weil emphasized a playful, bright visual language, which strongly resembled her cartoons for Viennese magazines in the 1930s. However, rather than entertaining, entertaining adult audiences, they put children's education in focus and were often concerned with introducing different cultures to young American readers. In later years, this also included personal in insights into her own story of emigration, as in To Sail a Ship of Treasures from 1984, dedicated to the memory of her parents. Introducing memories as her own ship of treasures, Weil sh shares some of her very own special treasures in simple text, accompanied by drawings that picture her early life, but also introduce aspects of Austrian cultures to her young readers. The book ends with her emigration, with the Anjos appearing in pictures, but without much text textual explanation. More importantly, it seems, was the aim to connect a child's experience with that of emigration, as Weil writes, I landed, in, I landed in New York no longer a child, yet like a child, I had to learn a new language and learn how to live in a new place. In her professional life, this learning how to live in a new place took on different facets, and not only drew on her experience as an illustrator, but also as a dancer. Indeed, aside from book publications, Weil's most successful venture was a television show produced by Weston Woods, a production company known for its creative approach to children's visual education. In The Sorcerer's Apprentice from 1962, she collaborated with the Little Orchestra Society, an American orchestra founded by the conductor Thomas Sherman in 1947. While the music was playing live, Weil made uh, live drawings from The Sorcerer's Apprentice um, with charcoal on a large white canvas, combining her practice in ballet and expressionist dance with illustration. In the 1960s too, she developed a series of educational sound film strips titled Children of Other Lands, described by the National Leader Institute for Teacher and Early Childhood Education as a highly recommended social studies series. Comprising of four stories about the lives of children in different countries and social settings, including that of an Austrian boy working in his grandfather's inn. Her children's programs were performed live across the United States for over 30 years, including fixtures such as the Lincoln Center, where she would decorate large scale canvases during her performances. Looking back at Weil's humorous illustrations from the 1930s, her playful approach to Austrian Alpine culture in relation to the Salzburg Festival and her caricatures of modern women's lives, her second career in the United States indicates a careful reframing of her core practice for new audiences. Despite her successful decade-long career in the United States, however, Weil's work has almost been forgotten in Austria and it was not until 2006 that one of her books, um, the Mozart von Wolfall, uh, was first translated into German. At the same time, the beginnings of her career in Austria are only brought uh, into relation with her later work. Um, the University of Minnesota, which hosts Weil's archive from the 1960s onwards, for example, predominantly focus on her, focuses on her work as an author and illustrator of children's books. Drawn together, however, Weil's biography brings together the career of a multivalent artist who consistently reinvented herself and combined a series of professional interests in order to forge an idiosyncratic career both before and after immigration. The many different stages of her training in interwar Vienna, including dance, drawing and stage design, not only led to her position as one of Vienna's first regular female cartoonists, it also set her up for a profession in the United States in which her playful sp style was put to new uses. In a comparative perspective of Weil's work before and after, the guiding principles thereby not only focus on stylistic similarities, but most crucially underline attem attempts of mapping different social and cultural environments to popular audiences, children and adults alike. Ultimately, therefore, the media uh, Weil chose for her line of work might seem marginal, but they offer unique insights into intercultural translation in popular culture from um, Vienna to Paris to Salzburg to New York, um, which merit closer attention. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Yulia. Um, equally fascinating and so many intersections with our um, previous week on, on Chizek and um, many of the other artists we've covered. So, um, so uh, I certainly have questions and comments, but I would um, officially like to open up the floor for discussion um, to either or both of our speakers today. Um, feel free to unmute yourself, use the chat, you know what to do. Thank you both for those wonderful talks. I really enjoyed hearing about your research and seeing all of the wonderful images. Um, I've been sort of formulating questions throughout the whole symposium. And I guess one question I have for, for both of you uh, is about, I don't even know how to phrase this exactly, whether you think that, that women designers, curators, um, critics in this early part of the 20th century may have been more open to um, uh, uh, sort of giving voice to marginalized artists or designers, um, either through, you know, the specific people and the different, you know, racial or ethnic or class identities that they represented, or even through the genre of the material, like children's literature being a kind of marginalized genre. It's not a very good question. <laughs> it's more just sort of an observation. And I wondered if if either you, Janice, or Yulia had thought about that in your research. I, I can say I definitely became aware of this. I, as I was researching the artist gallery, I was really struck by how many times that um, uh, they extended invitations to veterans, to um, artists that you know didn't yet have established reputations, obviously um, people that maybe were you know socially on an extreme um, in terms of like the paradigm, um, but they provided a venue um, for people that they believed artistically deserved their platform, their abilities to make their work better known. And certainly women were part of that, emigres were part of that. But I was also very happily surprised to see that African-American artists had a chance to exhibit that work there too. That isn't something I'd ever read about in any of the small amount of written literature that I'd seen on the artist gallery. So for me, that was um, a very pleasant eye opener that, that as you're saying, there truly seemed to be this openness and perhaps also because they were recent emigres themselves, they were aware of the prejudice that people could face for any number of reasons, you know, whether it was your gender, who you might have, you know, religiously, you know, been affiliated with your political inclinations, um, you know. So I do think that absolutely was a factor, even though I did not see it spoken about in any of the documentation. Yeah, that that's that's really interesting. I I didn't know about um Frederica Bear's work at uh, the gallery, and I didn't know about many of the Black artists that were represented there. So thank you so much for sharing that history. Mm. I I have a I have an answer in mind, but I'm not quite sure how to phrase it because I think on the one hand you're right, but on the other hand. I think in our research, we like to um, emphasize positive examples and focus on one. And, and I'm thinking this um, support on of, of minorities um, of whatever kind uh, is something that, of course, because it's something that is very important now and we all believe uh, in having to do this. But I wonder if we could not find opposite examples at the same time. So I, I'm... I'm I'm not, I would like to think that the women that we focus on um, are a sort of group where of a time, representative of a time where this was particularly important, but I'm I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, 
Yeah, because it, it seems like you could almost argue the opposite, that the women curators, you know, were sort of left to only be able to do the marginalized. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I see well, what you're well, saying. Well, Lisenberg was very successful in the interwar period, Rebecca. She was extremely, I mean, I think Yulia also showed us uh, how much, I mean, she published in the book, she was the house illustrator of the Bume, which was one of the most popular journals, and she, they allowed her to do whatever she wanted. And as you just showed, it was also, she, she I mean, as also my colleague, Patrick Kupon in Agri, um, in Agri Stadler in the book, she says that they allowed her a lot of the feminist or proto-feminist content of challenging attempts of women to beautify themselves. So a lot of her own, uh, and, also, her biographical or autobiographical references are great. Thank you, Julia. It's really very much. Great. So she does uh, allow herself to bring herself as herself as a author into the um, the public media and the public discourse. And with Bear Monty, I didn't really figure out. Um, are there any um, correspondence of hers, like what she's thinking, how she's processing her move, or? Her background, was there any autobiographical work or, or, or text or something that she would, that you could say, ha, here we find uh, Belmonte speaks for her and what you, about her motivation or about her uh, interests in contemporary art or was it, um, I don't know, like a given fact that she was acting from being a muse for Chile and linked into her own designing her own exhibitions um in New York. Yeah. Yes. Her, her yeah, her, her specific point of view is difficult to discern from something that she actually wrote. The artist gallery files that are at the Smithsonian and the Archives of American Art really preserve the documentation of the gallery itself. So there would be like photostat copies of letters that they sent or letters that were sent to her. So that's part of how I could intuit some of the correspondence that must have taken place. Unfortunately, you know, personal documentation that she might have sent to other places. Um, I'm still trying to find some of that. I became aware that she did keep a diary, but the person that mentioned this to me that knew about it had never seen it. And after her death, he said when he tried to track it down, it seemed it no longer existed. So it does seem that perhaps um, the, the niece, Greta Shapiro, who was the one who helped facilitate the donation of what survived of these records to the Smithsonian, I think focused on the business side of the work. Um, I have seen reference that the Austrian National Library does have some correspondence. I haven't seen it yet. I'm hoping on my next trip uh, to Vienna to be able to look at that. Um, but I have not found, sadly, any major treasure troves of documentation um, that share her perspective. Um, but from, from what I can read, it does seem she was in incredibly involved. She worked tirelessly going to meet with artists as long as she physically could, traveling to studios, talking to them. And when it became physically impossible or also due to time constraints, then she had the artists come and bring materials to her. And she was the one who was at the gallery much of the time because Styx was working his job. So he would come to the gallery in the evenings and would be there on the weekends. Um, but she would be there unless she was out visiting with artists. Or also, she we know from the, the documentation left that she went and visited other exhibitions at museums and at galleries because she saw that as part of her education to see what was happening in New York. And also she and Styx worked very hard to try to find the artists that they had like permanent better homes, either represented by bigger name dealers and or to get shows and exhibitions and to enter their collections. So they were sort of like always wanting to push these baby birds out of the nest. I just one more question. What did you find out about Styx? What's his background? I mean, I didn't figure this is interesting. What what was his background? Yeah, so he, he was born in Westchester. Um, you know, what what he has offered in an interview that I read 
is that his he grew up surrounded by art. His parents knew artists. His brother and sister went to the Art Students League. So he had been kind of in this circle of artists and must have spent, I think, a lot of time. Even though at Harvard, he did not study art as a major, he clearly had enough of an interest that he took art history classes and then pursued this museum studies course while he was there. And then went on this big junket traveling throughout Europe, looking at art as part of you know, it, it sounds like a, kind of the grand tour, as it were. Um, but I think he also recognized, very wise man, that it's very hard to live off of art, either as an artist, an art historian, or whatever it might be. And so I think for practical reasons, that's why he joined his father in this business that his father was very involved with. That was the day job. That's what made it possible for the artist gallery to be nonprofit. Uh, I just wanted to jump in really briefly, and then um, I want to hear Wanda's question, but just wanted to say I thought uh, Lana's comment was very helpful because I was wondering the same thing, you know, um, Bermonti seemed to be, you know, she emerged to, seems to come across as somewhat of an, of an enigma, and I would argue, you know, she's precisely of this generation of the 1890s the likes of a Vizutia, this sort of generation, and these comments that, you know, nothing but a socialite, um, we all know, you know, Alana's published on cultural patronage, you know, it's not a passive pursuit by any means. And, you know, even a Vizutia, who, whom Wanda has um, called, you know, the badass of her time. Um, <laughs> sometimes, you know, Vizutia could be very provocative, but on, on other times she could say, pottery is is light and gay and happy and you know has has nothing threatening so i i just wanted to comment that i felt that that um comment very helpful and that surely her own ambitions are are hidden behind those sort of trivializing um comments as well um wanda wanted to hear your question yeah uh, both uh both presentations were wonderful excellent and wonderful new material um, seems to be the theme. This uh, this whole thing and, and providing new new material for everyone. Um, but about Pier Monti, um, the uh, the list that you showed of all the um, was it like the advisory committee. They really are some of the major hitters of twentieth century museumology or you know museum studies and and collections, starting with the Bush Rising or. And also Maya Shapiro, I assume, is, was the, the critic and so forth. So curious if um, in if there was more correspondence or any um, if there's any paper trail of th these men and their reaction to to um, um, Fritzi <laughs> and and whether she was ever invited uh, to participate as a curator uh, at the Germanic Museum at Harvard or at any of these um, other institutions. And, and obviously I'm going, you know, did they take her seriously or was it was it the guy that was considered the, the serious partner to it? Because I think it's a it's very provocative that Barnes himself was um, you know purchasing the works and so forth. So obviously a really incredible feeder for 20th century um, American collections, and, and not just of Germanic art, but um, and, and any anything more about that sort of relationship. So what I would say is definitely the correspondence in the artist gallery records was directed equally to Fritzi as it was to Hugh Sticks. So mm -hmm. I think they were perceived as being equals. I think sometimes it was jointly addressed. It probably depended on who the relationship was strongest with or what it was about. So Sticks in general tended to be the one who was writing letters seeking funding. He did this on a yearly basis you know, very politely passing around the hat, as it were. I think things more in an art-related manner tended to be Fritzi, who was the one that was corresponding with the artists. As for the sponsors, um, Meyer Shapiro, yes, definitely also was involved, even though he was not on that list of founding sponsors. Um, unfortunately, this is such a voluminous topic. Um, and I do have my my day job here at the Doya Gallery, which keeps me quite busy. When I was at the Smithsonian, um, I focused my efforts on going through the artist gallery records 
which are quite enormous. They also have hue stick, some hue sticks material, but it's all on horrible microfilm, microfiche. Um, so I, and, and there's also such a vast quantity of that. I just barely scratched the surface and decided for the talk today to focus on Fritzi and the gallery, but I suspect there might be more documentation about the correspondence with those sponsors in the Styx papers, if it survives. But I, I think as well that because Styx had all of those connections with the people at Harvard and NYU, um, it made it so easy for him. And I'm sure Fritzi was the one who brought Joseph Hoffman on board. So, but I also agree to go back to Megan's comment. Absolutely. She was self-effacing. I think that was part of her personality. I think she was thought she was meant to be the, 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 the beautiful, the beautiful one, the supportive one, not necessarily the person taking the limelight and receiving credit for her considerable contributions. Further questions and comments? I always have more questions. <laughs> um, I, well, okay. So Janice, you mentioned something in your talk very briefly about um, the variations in Frederica Bear's name and how that presented some challenges in doing research. Could you say a little bit more about that? Well, yes, I mean, it's funny, this also goes back to, I think, one of the things that was brought up in last week's session about how research has changed, curation has changed, that a lot of things that really required, I mean, obviously still going to do original research in archives, in libraries, in museum collection files, et cetera. I mean, that's critical, essential. You can't live without it. But in my, you know, decades in this field, you know, the online searching has facilitated and it helps you to pinpoint places that you might have more productive avenues of research. And because in the Klimt painting, he spelled her name with a C-K-E, that's one unusual variation, but I think her parents did not include that C. So that's something that Klimt did for reasons I have yet to discern. Um, but then the fact that she was so fluid um, in the artist gallery stationery, that sometimes she's very clearly Federica Beer Monti, then sometimes she's very clearly Federica Beer. And there seem to be various annotations for the secretary about how she might want to be re referred to at specific times in their history. Um, I'm not sure where this ambivalence about her name truly came from. Um, and if she thought perhaps that the hyphenation gave her more stature, that she sounded more prominent by that. I mean, I can imagine it would be rather, you know, um, intimidating to have as her initial co-director, um, someone who had graduated from Harvard and had been through that same museum studies program as had the president. And certainly her relationship with Sticks, even though, you know, there is talk that this was romantic, at least briefly, um, before he married. Um, you know, sure, she was a woman in a man's world and in a role where ultimately, you know, she was the one, I think, largely making the decisions about what would be included and where it would be shown. So I can imagine that the the name became something of a uniform that she put on to help validate that position. It's just my suppositions based on what I've seen, the different notes I've seen in the files. Um but I don't honestly know. I, I I hope that maybe someday her diary or diaries, if there are more than one, that they will turn up. And um, certainly, hopefully, I think one great thing about this symposium is now that this is out there, lots of other people, you know, will hear what we're working on and other people will continue these research avenues and maybe even share with this pool of, you know, dedicated researchers information that they became aware of, too, and will continue to unearth some of these Lingering questions. I have one more um, uh, question, Janice. Um, it has been um, uh, suggested that you had a Jewish background. Would you have any only Jewish uh, background at all? 
I'm not sure about that. I mean, I believe she did, but she did also comment that during the war that it she didn't leave the country said specifically because she had to. She said she could have followed Hans Böhler to Switzerland, that she had other avenues and that she came to New York because she wanted to and that she was eager to try something new. So I think that's one bit of insight that we have. Um, you know, I'm not sure if she was discreet about her origins, just because that was something that one do, did for self-preservation or did not want to draw attention to it at that time. That's another thing that I hope to be able to look into further. I think Bella did some research on it because he was convinced that she had something. Um, so I, just, I didn't follow the arguments there, but uh, with one and and. Uh, Correspondence on it, maybe Stephen Bell would have the biggest music. May I ask another question? Um, for, uh, this one's to Yulia. Um, I'm absolutely fascinated by the slides you showed of her doing the drawing simultaneously as the as the symphonies playing so it's like this magnificent performance art where is is that could you just say a little bit more about that i i think you've done this before but i apologize i haven't you know not on but i uh because that is that's pretty interesting <laughs> There is actually, I didn't dare trying to show the video because I wasn't sure oh. how it worked work with the connection. Um, but I'm hoping that we can draw it up on our website. Um, so the way that it worked was that she sort of had the theme. I'm, I've mentioned the Sorcerer's Apprentice and the video that is available online um, also shows the Sorcerer's Apprentice. But she did it for different um, performances. So the, the toy shop that I mentioned was another one of the performances. And basically, um, I think you could see it a little bit on, on the picture that the whole back of the canvas um, was um, lined out, uh, the whole back of the stage was lined out with one big, big canvas. And she would start on the one side um, and then it was like, a yeah, it was a live performance to the live orchestra. And she would just move along um, in, maybe you could call it expressionist dance moves. Um, and while doing this uh, draw up uh, different scenes often they were figurative and um, they were of course very quick um, and they were always directed at child at children so it was um it was mostly yeah it was for children's entertainment the performances um and i think and i still need to look into this but th there was a more permanent collaboration with the lincoln center that was the sort of main um place where she where she would perform this but she also moved around do any of these um, drawings still exist? I mean, that's phenomenal. She's at, she's she's moving, dancing, and drawing at the same time. Um, so, but, but it was meant to be uh, viewed at. But was there back to Chizek and and you know his interest in movement and so forth? Was this at all um, a pedagogical technique that um, she? she meant to disseminate you know or, or inspire others to 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 utilize for their for their for the kids themselves not just to perform in front of them in a lot of her work there is a very clear pedagogical element also in the stories it's always about teaching teaching something in a in a playful way um so yeah i have to look into this further but it wouldn't surprise me if the if there was um, and as to the the drawings themselves, uh, I'm also not sure yet. They were made with charcoal mostly. Um, mm -hmm. And I suppose they must have been um, rolled up after somehow. So I don't know how easy it was to preserve them. Um, and um, from what I know about the performances, my sense is also that it was really more about the performance itself rather than having, having the complete... Uh, um, outcome of it um, right. as drawings, yeah. Huh. Is there any precedent for that? Anybody is? Does anybody you know listening here right now? Does anybody? I mean, I I find that extraordinary, but <laughs> no. I I 
have, um, I, I've talked about this with Yulia before, I think, but I did come across an artist that I wasn't familiar with before, uh, Hermina Rice, I believe, um, who was, uh, and she did have some kind of a pedagogical method that she developed that I don't think had to do with dance per se, but with music. So like performing music and painting rhythmic, I think she even called it like the rhythm rhythmic method or something like that in about the 1920s and 30s. I think that Sam Albert just posted a link to one of the videos. Um, so I hope you can see it play. Actually, it made me think also something that Megan said before and also Alana about, um, on the one hand, this very strong feminist expression um, and this freedom of uh, really having an outspoken um, voice. And now thinking about the, the performances as being something that is quite ephemeral, uh, but then also the illustrations, because of course they're not a sort of frame works that you would put somewhere on a wall but they're sort of picture journalism um, and I think that maybe um, if we talk about media one of the opportunities to have more freedom in expression is exactly in working in those um, maybe not necessarily marginal because they're quite visible but also uh, in media that that are potentially easily discarded because you know that there are more um, so that leaves more more freedom to be open about something. Um, maybe this is also something that we, we we could consider. I think that's a great point. And I was going to throw out a brief follow-up question to, to both of you, you know, um, something we've covered in many of the talks, and that is the challenges of, of fitting a woman artist like this into the canon or making a case for her as the great woman artist when her specialty is in you know, media that have not always been given the artistic respect and serious study they des deserve. So, you know, the cartoons, the graphic art uh, illustration, the children's book illustration, um, obviously the work of my colleague, Rebecca Hausa, I mean, she's done amazing work on the valorization of historically feminine media like textiles. So I feel that the field has has changed and is changing, but perhaps maybe these the work of these women in the graphic arts along with the publications Alana mentioned is um, is maybe the next wave, perhaps. I mean, what might you have to, to say? Um... Do you want to speak at all on the methodological challenges, the theoretical challenges or? No, I, I yes, definitely, because I've, I'm encountering them quite strongly at the moment. The one aspect of her work that I find the most fascinating, the more I get into it, are actually the children's books. Because there are so many, and there are so many where she creates the narrative and also does the drawings for them. And um, this is something where you really have to work interdisciplinary, of course. And then um, I suppose as someone who is has some specialism in cartooning and caricature and Central Europe, my way of, as I showed it in the presentation, uh, is to look back at how she did it before. Um, but of course, approaching this, um, it would also be quite important to look at this in a broader field of children's literature, how, how that works. Um, oh, yes. So <laughs> I can see, I don't want you, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I saw that Kirsten Quick agner has turned on a camera and I think that she's looking at uh, Lisa Weiss' work more from this perspective. So it would be really great to have her comment as well if if she wants to. Yes, yeah, sorry, I had to step away for ten minutes because uh, I had uh, I'm teaching a class, <laughs> so I told them I had to attend a very important conference. So I'm back, but I uh, so appreciate you you both uh, your talks and all the research you've done, and I'm also. I feel like a detective trying to find out more about Lisa Lavalle. I, I think I mentioned to you, Yulia, in an email that I tracked down her great niece who lives in 
I hope I'm getting this right, Auckland. And so uh, she was trying to get more information from her mother, but she has not responded to future to further emails. So I will I will take that uh, up again this summer. But the the wonderful thing is, last summer I was able to spend three days with Liesel Salsa's fr family friend, who's the last uh, one of the last living people to have known her, and he met Liesel Weil on some trips. Uh, when he and his wife went to New York with Liesel Salsa to meet Liesel Weil. And they remember that Liesel Weil was very proud of the fact that she had illustrated and written 139 books. And the reason he remembered that is because she came to the U.S. in 1939. And so that number stuck stuck with him. And I, I've been slowly buying the children's books on eBay, you know, especially the ones that have uh, that are tied to her um her her life, for example, is exactly the the books you mentioned, Wolfa, Wolfal, and uh, to sail a ship of Trevor, treasures. And I'm also trying to make a link to Weil's trips uh, to visit Bettina Bauer Ehrlich in um, in Italy. I believe they may have traveled together because Liesel Salsa went to Europe twice. Um, so I'm still piecing that all together. But uh, it's unfortunate that nobody knows really where Liesel Weil's papers are uh, from her. Uh, you know, the when in her apartment from New York, from what I've understood is that most of her letters and journals and things disappeared or someone inherited them. And so I'm not sure. I'm still trying to work on that. I don't know if this, uh, sorry, I was just very enthusiastically answering, but yeah, she, uh, her children's books, many of them have to do with her travels to Europe. And as you said, about Austrian uh, folklore and um, and that's that's the same thing I'm writing about for Bettina uh, Bauer Ehrlich is that her works focus on her joyful childhood and her safe childhood in Italy as well as uh, her memories of Austria. So um, there are more of those from Bettina Bauer Ehrlich available. So. If I can add, it would also be very uh, interesting to compare it to because there are some books on uh, that Weil writes about Italy, mm -hmm. uh, about um, this little girl who goes to Venice and then she finds a friend right. and really lovely illustrations. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wasn't aware about how long the relationship with Bettina Bauer Ehrlich was, but of course Bauer Ehrlich has a lot of very Italian themed books. Mm -hmm. um, Right. So it'd be interesting to compare them and also consider if they visited how right. how this was a sort of parallel production well, in a way. If you don't mind me adding two more uh, f uh, fun facts, shall we call them? Uh, last summer I went to the Schloss Belvedere to the to the research uh, institute, and I have been I looked through every single diary. Uh, cal they're basically calendar books, work calendars, uh, from. I think it was 1940 to 1985 when she passed away. And in there, there are a couple mentions of her meetings with uh, uh, with Liesel Weil, um, where Liesel came to, to Italy to visit her. So at some point I'm gonna be doing this because uh, I'm writing three biographies of, of all three women. That's my goal for this summer, you know, shorter ones. And then I'm hoping to cross-reference trips they took um, what was the other fun fact I was going to say? Oh, shoot. I lost my train of thought. Um, oh, uh, oh yes. The family friend in, in Seattle, uh, David, P uh, Perrine told me that he, uh, because he was very closely, uh, bonded to Liesel's also, she was like a mother to him. He said that almost every weekend that Liesel's also and, and Bettina Bauer Ehrlich talked as well as Liesel Weil, so Bettina Bauer was the first to pass away in 1985, but they almost spoke every single weekend and they would speak in German, in Austrian German. Um, so they kept their culture alive. So I'm going to be giving a, a paper at the GSA uh, at a round table, and I'm going to be talking about the Zinkenbacher Mala Colony. But over the summer, I plan to do more research. I'm very happy to collaborate with both of you and and all of you who are here. So uh Hopefully we can we can celebrate their lives and represent them more out there. It's amazing how we now manage to do networking online because yes. this is always the thing that was missing from having online conferences. So thank you. That would be amazing. Yeah. 
And I will be in Vienna this summer in case anyone happens to be there. I'll put my email in the chat box. I would love to be in touch with any of you who are working on these wonderful women. And like I said, one of my most uh, wonderful research moments was last summer when I got to meet with Lisa Zarza's family friends. And really, he told me so much about her life. And I hope to include that in, in the biographies I'm writing. Uh, but there is so much cross, I don't know if you call it cross-pollination, because these three women were friends. They trained together. And that was the foundation for their success and the resilience and their creativity. And, and as you put it, uh, you both put it, you know, their reinvention of the of their work and their identity. I did have a brief follow-up question for Janice, mm -hmm. which also relates to this last topic, because of course I was thrilled to see um, Erlich Bauer in included. And, you know, one of her best known paintings is Joni Spät auf, relating to the theme mm -hmm. of black um, performers. So, Janice, I was so um, pleased to see this inclusion of the Hans Böhler and um, Selma Burke material. I mean, we tried to get an essay for erasures on that relationship um, because, you know, Selma Burke is, is well known in this country, Harlem Renaissance artist, but her time in Vienna, the fact that she wrote on her experience as a black woman there, that she commented on the anti-Semitism. So not only how her art was, was transformed by her time in Vienna, but the fact that that Berda, who is relatively still um, unknown, this Klimt group sort of mysterious artist, um, <laughs> transformed by his encounter with with the Harlem uh, Renaissance. So maybe not a question, but I'm just so excited to see something um, on this. Um, thank you. And I was delighted, just as a happenstance, to discover that the Belvedere had that great painting, Jack's Bar in Harlem. I mean. <laughs> Who knew? I didn't. I didn't realize. So it's it's wonderful how the pollination went back from New York to Vienna, also. Mm -hmm. One last question: Did these um, these Viennese women who went to New York did they have did, did they have any interconnection while in New York? There must have been like a really great salon <laughs> material. Uh, you know, did did they just were they clueless or did they they must have known each other somehow or known of each other? Any any inf any any of the and, and you make it as well. You're you know these are these are. I mean, Vienna's a big place, but and New York's a big place, but it just seems that they would be kind of, their circles would be overlapping. They were interrelated, um, they were interrelated circles, but Bear, Monty, and Lisa Weil, if this is the question, if they cross paths, I mean, they, you should know more, Julia and Kristen, but um, as far as I know, it was parallel. So Lizzie mm -hmm. Weil was with Selinko, Anna Marie Selinko, the woman, the author of the Zire. And um, and the networks of the Bune. Also very assimilate, I mean acculturated Jewish background. So very much network in insiders. And Bermonti was part of the Wiener Bergstedt with Joseph Hoffman. It's, it was parallel, it's not necessarily the cross paths, but maybe you know more, Julia and Kristen. Maybe through the, uh, uh, block, um, the Bauer connection, but I'm not sure. I, I'm, I, add, I mean, maybe this isn't, I don't want to create a sort of generational divide, but I think that the, maybe that also played a role. Um, because I also think that about the memoirs of Liesl Salzer, for example, this whole idea about the Zinkenbacher Maler colony going to the time before immigration did, that was like really this time of wild girls trying <laughs> themselves out. This is very much the sense that you get. Um, so I suppose that also immigration at different stages of their lives um might have also i mean i suppose they might have known each other but as elana said more parallel mm -hmm. um yeah I, I would agree with that um and also um one of uh, federica's sister charlotta had moved to new york um so i think for her 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 
her place in life was different. Her station in life at that point was different. She was more involved with family, with the gallery. Um, I do agree that there was certainly awareness in trying to keep in touch with that Viennese and Austrian community, but I'm not seeing um, specific uh, connections um, with the artists that um, Julia and others have been speaking about. I, I found a, a wonderful thing uh, during last summer when I was researching, and I found the guest book to a cafe called Café Eclair, and the name of the owner escapes me, but he was a refugee. Um, he was a Zuckerhändler from Vienna, but from Eastern Europe, and he, via Vienna, then fled to New York, and he met and married another emigre um, for her second marriage, whom I also wrote about and whose name escapes me at this very moment. But in the guest book, which the Leo Beck Institute has, I found uh, a little illustration of a Gugelhupf by um, Liesl Weil. And so one of my <laughs> goals was to like go through there and see who else, you know, has written in the guest book. And but so I think that was a meeting spot for many uh, Viennese and Eastern European um, exiled artists. Uh, but again, I, that's just yet one other project I, I was going to look into. But I love the Google Hoof illustration uh, in there. So, but but I I also am having very difficult time trying to piece together the dates. I did come across uh, a, a list of galleries in which Liesel Zalsa uh, exhibited in New York, and then on her way across the U.S. when she moved to Seattle. So that's been helpful. But but Vile has been my most elusive of the three friends. Mm -hmm. um, what a stimulating discussion today. Um, any closing questions or thoughts? Um, I imagine that many of us have 3 p.m. appointments, so we'll have to wrap up relatively soon. But any any further thoughts or comments? This was a highlight of my week, so thank you so much. I'm, I'm uh, sitting here at Wofford College in South Carolina, <laughs> so it's ex I feel it's uh, in such an international and wonderful group. So thank you to the speakers. Thank you. Um, yes. So warmest thanks to to Julia uh, and Janice for speaking today. Fascinating material. Fascinating talks. Thank you okay, so so we, yeah, we're going to sign off so everybody can get to their next um, commitment. But thank you so much for joining us. Thank you both. Thank you. Great to see everyone.